Today's sponsor is Bittrex, a cryptocurrency exchange dedicated to security and trust. You'll be hearing all about Bittrex later on in the show. It's my pleasure to welcome back to Forward Guidance, Vincent Deluarge, Director of Global Macro at StoneX. Vincent, great to have you back. How are you doing? Always a pleasure. It's been a while. I'm very happy to speak with you. It's been too long, Vincent. Little under a year ago, you came on this program. You were one of my first guests and you said inflation will come in way hotter than people think and it will be sustained and it will cause a a, a radical shift in asset allocation where bonds are undervalued, technology investments are undervalued. Are are overvalued, excuse me. And uh, sort of, you know, materials, energy, that stuff is, is very undervalued. Everything you you said in that interview a year ago has come exactly to pass. And now, Vincent, we're at a, a place where the mainstream narrative is, oh, yeah, inflation, you know, that's a 2022 story. But going forward, the real risk is recession and deflation, that uh, the, the, the overzealous hiking of central bankers has tightened money so much that the real cause of inflation, which is supply side, you know, it's, it's, it's the lumber, it's the nails, it's the oil, it's the natural gas, that has very little to do with monetary policy. So what the Fed is really doing is just hiking into a recession and, and making it worse. So the, the real risk is deflation. You say, and correct me if I'm wrong, no, not at all. Not only will inflation remain high at 5 to 7%, but you think that that's a good thing. So explain your case and why is the mainstream narrative that, that I just articulated so wrong? Well, I mean, I, I used to kind of make the joke that, you know, this recession talk has been with us for, for about a year now. And I used to make the joke that, you know, worrying about a recession in, you know, early 2022 was like worrying about more damage in your basement when the house on the fire. Like the problem was inflation. It was not recession. Um, I am starting to see things a bit differently. Uh, I do think the economy has slowed. Something broke somewhere this summer. I mean, you can clearly see it in the, in, in the real estate market, for example. Uh, we, we may have some some issue in securitized markets. Uh, we, we may have uh, even the actual economy slowing a little bit. Uh, that being said, I remain the camp that, you know, if it's a kind of Caribbean and Silla type of situation where you have to pick one, I think the the bigger long-term risk is, is inflation, not so much recession, even though I, I am open to the possibility now that the economy does experience a recession in, in 2023. I still think it's going to be a, a most extraordinary recession, one that doesn't feel like a recession. I think the labor market remains tight. Uh, I, and I also don't think that that inflation actually slows down. Um, or slows on significantly. I mean, I do think it peaked at one nine point one at least for this cycle, uh, and it's, it's certainly going to come down. I doubt that it's going to come down much below below four, uh, and then I think it stays there for the rest of the decade. And as you hinted, uh, this is part of my kind of longer uh, macro thesis that inflation is actually the solution. It is the medicine that that the global economy needs. Inflation and financial repression. Uh, and um, um, it's painful, and I think our our industry resists it because the biggest loser in this scenario would be uh, well people who work in the financial industry. Uh, but if you really think about what the world needs and how to achieve that, uh, I think inflation is probably the least painful way to accomplish uh, the great rebalancing of the global economy. Why do you think inflation will? remain high and how do you what's your answer to the argument that the inflation that we've seen up until this point which has been very high has been high because of supply chain issues there aren't enough ships there aren't enough packages uh there's a lockdown in china uh, uh, the war in ukraine all of these non-monetary non-demographic sort of non-core if you can exogenous uh, creators of inflation and those are not going to be with us for long. And as a result, inflation will, will fall, fall sharply. And, and also, you know, the price of oil can only go to $120 uh, uh, once. And the price of oil is going down. The business cycle is, is slowing. So what gives you confidence to, to, to say, no, inflation will remain high? 
Well, first of all, I, I'm not sure that all these things are, are solved. I mean, to me, they don't seem solved. I mean, we still have lockdowns in China. Uh, I'm not sure what the hell happened at that, that Congress, but it didn't look like it was very bullish for uh, the world economy and global supply chains. Uh, I, I didn't hear that there was, a, you know, a, a peace deal on the table between Putin and Zelensky. Uh, if anything, I see just acceleration, and, and I'm not sure that we will not see other supply chain problems pop up. I think there is this kind of um, almost nonchalant, laissez-faire uh, attitude when it comes to, oh, yeah, this is just tiny supply chain problem. And they're not tiny and they're not being solved. Stepping back for a second, uh, you know, why did we not have uh, inflation uh, or very low inflation, disinflation since, since the late 90s? Well, what happened? And I, and I attribute fundamentally to, to three forces. And I'm just going to go through them and we'll see whether they're likely to, to keep occurring again. One is kind of global savings left. We had this massive reserve accumulation in primarily in East Asia, uh, but also in Europe and also by OPEC countries uh, for a bunch of different reasons. But this was the age of the sovereign wealth fund. And that means that the, the deficits that we had in, in, in the US, in UK, Canada, Australia were being reinvested into the US, into the treasury market, keeping yields down and keeping the cost of capital artificially low. Uh, that was the first deflationary uh, tailwind. Uh, the second we had was this extraordinary demographic dividend uh, from this abnormal large boomer generation. So boomers are born between 46 and, and 65. Uh, so the median is born in, in 1955. So by the mid 90s, he was getting in his 30, in his 40s. And when you are in the 40s, this is a time when you become a, a net saver, right? You bought the house. Um, and then eventually the kids leave home, you're at peak earnings, so you become an empty nester, a peak saver in your late 50s. So this is when your 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 um, ability to save greatly exceeds your, your consumption needs. Uh, so consumption falls and net savings increase, and this was happening across the developed world and even some developing countries as well. So that was a big push down on demand, excess savings, lower cost of capital, lower inflation. And then the third factor, uh, was uh, Mexican immigration. Uh, in, in the 90s, we had about 10 million uh, migrants across the Rio Grande. And these were, by and large, young men who were of working age. You know, it was a massive deflationary shock for, for services and agriculture. Uh, so to me, these are your, your three um, deflationary um, uh, tailwinds. So cheaper cost of capital, cheaper labor, and cheaper goods uh, from China. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, my case is that these three are reversing right now. Uh, and they've actually, they've been reversing for a long time. I mean, if you look at that big savings glut that I was talking about, uh, Japan and Germany had current account deficits this year. Uh, the Chinese current account surplus is no longer growing, and it's being invested domestically or in Belt and Road initiative. Uh, the petrol state savings glut, obviously, after, after Putin's assets, Russia's assets were seized, uh, this is going to make people think about whether they really want to keep uh, U.S. treasuries. Uh, as, as, as their reserves. Um, and then the, uh, the third one, the Mexican immigration is actually negative, especially since COVID we've seen a lot of Mexicans who were fired. They had to walk back and now they started their lives back. Uh, the, the difference in lifestyle is actually, you know, the living in San Jose is much lower. I mean, if anything, I was, I was in Rocho in Mexico two months ago. Everybody was American. I mean, the biggest risk facing the Mexican economy is a takeover by Los Angeles creative types who can work from home. We no longer have the cheap goods from China. We no longer have the cheap capital from, from the recycling of the, the global savings slots. Uh, and uh, we have far fewer uh, cheap workers. And yes, people will say, well, but, you know, we still have immigration on the southern border. But no, nothing is as big and as close as integrated as Mexico. This was a one-time event. Uh, and Mexico is aging very rapidly. I mean, in, uh, in 10 years, Mexico will actually be older than the U.S. So, there, you know, we will not have these this, this resources. We spent it already. Can you explain the, you know, the, the demographic point? So a lot of people say, oh, look at Japan, a rapidly aging population. When, when you're you know, in your 40s and 50s, you don't spend as much money. But uh, how are the demographics now, quote, better or more inflationary, let's say, in, in the U.S. or, or even in, in, in other places? Right. So I, I think the relation with aging and, and inflation is, is, is kind of a, a, a U, uh, which is why I think people get it wrong. Because, yeah, I do agree in the first order, it is deflationary, right? When your median population moves from, let's say, your median age rises from 27 to 40, which is pretty much what... Uh, 
the US did. Europe is a bit further ahead. It's more like 30 to, to, to 48 or something like that. But that is that is disinflationary because uh, when you have a young population, uh, you have a lot of consumption needs, right? When, when you're young, I mean, you, you do, well, before you, you're 25, you don't, don't produce. So you're net consumer. And then even for your, the first 10 years of your, of your life, you, you typically don't make that much money and you face a lot of, of big expenses, your first home, your first fridge, your first car, uh, school for the kids. Uh, so you, your net savings position is, is negative. I mean, if, um, um, in economic terms, I think so. The, the Modigliani life cycle hypothesis, uh, where, where your, your savings uh, drop first, and you try, you want to smooth them all the time in, in the model. But here, I'm just focusing on the shape. So it drops first, and then by the time you reach your you reach your forties, hopefully you can make more money. Uh, you've paid down the house. You're no longer popping kids every year, uh, so you can start saving a little bit, and then that increases a lot. I think around turning points, probably mid fifties. Because uh, your kids are done with college, so you're no longer paying with them. Um, your, your parents are, are old or, or even dead, so you don't, you no longer need to pay for them. And you, you are at peak earnings, so you can save about you know, 50%, 60% of your income. Now, as a whole, this is what happened to the Western world. We moved from a, a very young, when the boomers were young in the, in the, the early 90, uh, 70s, we had a lot, a lot of inflation. And then it slowed down as they progressively aged and started to save. Now, however, we're reaching the point where uh, really this is inverting. Uh, I mean, if you think, I, I think the uh, the midpoint of the boomer generation is around 1956. Uh, and um, it's also the year with the highest live births in the US, about 5 million babies. And what's interesting about that cohort is that it's reaching 65 next year. And in the US, when you reach 65, you become eligible, eligible for Medicare and, and, and your social security. So we'll have a, a huge shift where this, this big bulge of population used to be peak savers. And now it's going to be, well, I mean, if you stop working, I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> this seems so basic to me, you're no longer producing. So yeah, maybe your consumption drops a little bit. And I'm not that sure that people consume less when they retire, but whatever. But your production goes to zero. So net, you have more consumption less production, it has to be inflationary. Just to, to, to distill that point for, for me and the audience, the conventional wisdom is that old people are de deflationary. People get older, they save more, they spend less, they're not doing household formation, having kids, that's deflationary. You're saying, yes, between the ages of 45 and 65, that cohort is deflationary because okay. they are working and saving a lot of money and not spending as much money. But once they hit 65, you know, in the, in the US, boom, you get Social Security, boom, you get Medicare, boom, you start, you know, uh, uh, taking a lot of vacations, you start spending more money. Um, and, you know, in many cases, you're not working. So actually, 45 to 65, that cohort is deflationary, but above 65, sort, sort of, uh, you know, more, more like senior, senior citizens, those people are not deflationary. They are inflationary. Correct. You get, you get, you get fewer people to produce and more people who need other people to, to service their needs. The net effect is just upward pressure on wages for the young people, which we are certainly seeing in the U S uh, and, 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 um, more demand compared to what the, the economy can, can produce. And so, Vincent, let's say someone says, okay, I get all of these forces you're talking about, the, the deglobalization, uh, uh, fewer immigrants coming to, to work, um, uh, sort of the, the end of the savings glut. But, Vincent, as everyone knows on Wall Street, we're headed for a recession, and rece recessions destroy demand, and when the demand is destroyed – uh, inflation goes down because the, the prices of, of things, uh, you know, that no one really wants them anymore. So why is it that you think inflation will remain robust in light of uh, the, uh, a recession? Because, you know, going 2008, uh, 2000, 2001, 1981, 1974, 1975, recessions ca you know, caused the rate of inflation to go down, right? So, so what, 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 why do you think otherwise? Well, first of all, historically, you are right about 2008. You're right about 2000, 2001. I'm not sure you're right about 1974-75. No, I mean, I'm not saying I'm not saying it caused it to go down to two percent. I'm saying it caused it to go down. <laughs> yes, fine, fine, yeah, fine. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Point taken. Yes, inflation will go down. Inflation is going down. Uh, I am, uh, you know, make a. Uh, a, a big flashing sign. Uh, Vincent agrees with the peak inflation guys. Okay, that's it. That's it. I'm not breaking not news. Saying, 
Okay. <laughs> yes. You know, noted inflationista Vincent Delaward <laughs> says that peak inflation is here. Yes, and 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 I said that this summer as well. Um, now, what I may, um, what I think I differ from consensus that I don't think we go back to two. Uh, I think we go to four, maybe four point five, uh, and I think then we have a, a wonderful moment where um, you know the Fed can. Um, uh, you know, I, I keep thinking about the, the war in Iraq, uh, and um, if you remember, you know that was a, that was a bit of a mistake. There was no WMDs, nothing went as planned, and 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 then uh, you know the the best thing to do in this situation is to to get a big aircraft carrier, a big mission accomplished sign, and, and call it a victory, and, and never talk about it again. I think the Fed will do the exact same thing next year. They messed up with transitory. Um, I don't think they really want or should really break the economy, break the labor market, uh, wreck the world with a dollar index at two hundred. I mean, they just want to show that they tried, and 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 they have that chance. The economy is slowing. Base effects are getting better in commodities. So if things go the way they are by March, March, April, we're looking at maybe 5% inflation. We're going to have a 5% Fed funds rate job done raised. You know, I raised the rates above, you know, inflation. I, you know, well, if it's not falling, it's probably somebody else's fault. You know, you can blame it on Putin or on, on fiscal policy or whatever, or the need to preserve financial stability. That always works. Um, and, and then we can do what, what I think is the solution for the long term, which is be like, you know what? You know, we're not going to go back to 2%. That, that, that target, it was bullshit all along. We made it up anyway. There is no economic foundation for it. Uh, and, and, you know, what's, it's not too bad, you know. Let, let's have it run at four, five percent for a couple of years, uh, and, and and I think when they do that, um, it will be good. It will be good. Like, why would you, I mean? I guess yes. Technically, if, if Powell hikes to ten percent, sure, we we can get uh, we can destroy the housing market. Uh, we can have zero new construction in the U.S. Uh, we can get the unemployment rate to soar. We can get like food stamps line like we had in the thirties. Uh, we can destroy, you know, the dollar can go to uh, 200 dollar index can go to 200 and, and thus destroying the economies of Egypt, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, uh, Jordan, uh, Morocco, and, and create like food riots everywhere. Um, but why? Why would you want to do that? Like, I mean, your, your job is your job is not like your job, your job is to keep the world a happy place. Um, and, and and I would argue that having a hard labor market is is what what we need. I mean, what we've needed for for twenty years. What we are seeing rapid wage gains from for uh, poor workers, young workers, paid hourly, minority workers. Um, this is perfect. This is the economy rebalancing itself. Uh, so why would you go against that? So that's a convincing argument about why 4% inflation, 5% inflation is not the end of the world. Later on, I, I want to get your thoughts on, on why you think that. But for now, I want to ask you, why do you think Jay Powell thinks that or members of the Federal Reserve think that? Uh, you, know, you may say that, oh, yes, this 2% target, it, it's new. But to them, this 2% target it, is like you know, uh, Moses coming down from Mount Sinai, you know, it, it is, it, it, and it would be very heretical for them to ever acknowledge that, uh, even implying it. So, you know, right now, Powell, his, his statements say, no, we need, uh, uh, I forget the exact verbiage, uh, uh um, you know, substantial progress, uh, to, to on inflation coming down and, you know, that I mean, that means that not not two percent, maybe, but headed to two percent and five percent does not sound like headed to two percent. So, yeah, tell us about why you think the two percent target is BS. And then tell us why do you think that Powell will, to use the P word, pivot? Well, um, you know, he didn't quite get the two percent target from a talking bush on, on the top of Mount Sinai. Uh, he got it from a New Zealand uh, economist in, in the late eighties who was interviewed on TV about inflation targeting and didn't know quite to answer about what's the right level of inflation is. So it just went up with 2% because that's um, not too high, not too low. Uh, and, and, you know, why not? I mean, and then that spread after New Zealand, I think the bank of England took it and the bank of Canada. And by the way, it only became, um, law can you know like uh, in the official fed corpus in 2012 after after Berlin. so it's really you know it's only 10 years of actual two percent targeting i mean you cannot find a two percent target anywhere in certainly not in the federal reserve act or or 
any any documents before the the two thousands. So it's not that 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 strong a, a target. And and I would also argue that you know you you may want to keep it. You know you like 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 uh, like the Romans did with their god. You know you you do the offering. You know just to keep make sure that but but you actually change like you know if you change the index you know you, you can probably I and mean, we change the index plenty of times over time we had a you know hedonistic adjustment in the, yeah. in the, in the 90s we we changed the oer in the late 80s uh oh, there's a good case to change the oer right now i mean as you, as, as you know you know as everybody points out it's lagging so it's like driving the rear. so i think there are two yeah, yeah just, just, just let's explain that for the audience so uh owner equivalent rent I, I do have a pretty good understanding of that where Back in the day, actual home price appreciation counted in the index. So when the prices of housing went up, people said, oh, housing is a good that you buy. So that goes up. But now that now they, they change it to it's only shelter costs. So they ask homeowners, theoretically, if you were to put your house uh, out for rent, what would you earn? And based on that theoretical number, they come up with owner's equivalent rent. And that is you know, a, a, a part of the critique of the consumer price index that the, the weighting has changed. And then hedonic adjustment, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's, that's when you know, a vacuum cleaner used to cost $20, but now it costs $50. So that would be an increase of 150%. But they say, oh, the old vacuum cleaner couldn't do this special little technique and it didn't have this technology so that actually you're getting the new technology. So really it's not up 150%. It's actually only up 10%, right? That's right. Or the phone plan that gives you two gigabyte of data and now it gives you five and it only costs, you know, 20% more, but yeah. yeah. Same, the iPhone it used to cost 200 bucks. Now it costs 1300 bucks, but you get so much more, Vincent, you get so much more. <laughs> Um, I mean, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, uh, so, yeah, so that I think you made a, a perfectly fine summary of, of what these tweaks are. And, you know, it's not really my interest to, you know, you have a bunch of gold bugs that would, you know, like recreate uh, CPI indices and tell you that true inflation. I mean, maybe, maybe not. I mean, the, the point is that this is a target. I mean, both the, the tool and the target were made up uh, and they were adjusted over time. And I think that's a good thing. I think you should be able to adjust uh, your inflation target. I think inflation is a political decision at the end of the day. And I don't think there is any sort of God-given level of, of, of inflation that's good for economic growth. I mean, I in my, my upcoming report, I was just plotting inflation versus average growth in the U.S. And, and what you can see is really all that we see is that, okay, when you have deflation, yeah, growth slows. And when you have inflation in excess of 10%, growth slows also. And then I agree with that, right? Deflation, I mean, you know, kind of, you know, it's like the economy for, for going into for an ice age. Uh, and then uh, inflation above 10%, it's hard to make plans, right? I mean, you have to, there's a cost of just switching the, the, the signs when you sell. Uh, you can't invest for the long term because you don't know what's going to happen. Um, you also have resources hoarding. Uh, so this is like, you know, Venezuela, Argentina, like, no, it's certainly, I don't want to go there. Uh, but between, honestly, between zero and 10, you can pick any number as long as it's fairly stable, the economy will adjust. And if anything, growth tended to be fastest when inflation has been between four and eight uh, percent. So there is no reason to go to two percent. Uh, there is no reason to 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 use this 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 broken index. Uh, we can always change it, and and our, I believe we should change it. I think you know economists love to talk about R star, right? I mean. You, can write like thousands of PhDs, and that's great because no one can call you on it because you can't see R star, right? So it's the laziest way to get a job at the Fed. Write something dumb about R star. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a guess about a number that is completely made up. It's correct, correct. <laughs> uh, well, I would talk about. I would and sorry, just for the audience, visit. So R, R star is the Fed's estimate of the level at which uh, growth and labor market inflation are roughly stable. So above our star, that's tight monetary policy. Below our star, that's loose monetary policy. Our star is like Goldilocks. Yeah, the, that natural rate, like, you know, absent, uh, absent an intervention, that's where the, the economy was at. We should be like, well, maybe just don't intervene, <laughs> but whatever. Um, uh, the point is, maybe there's a natural level of interest rates. What I would argue is that there is a natural inflation rate. Let's call it I star. And that thing changes over time, and that thing is inherently political. It changes over time very clearly, as I explained in the in the seventies, 
We had structurally high inflation because the boomers were coming of age, uh, because we were doing the Great Society, the Vietnam War. So it would have been way too costly to bring inflation down to 2%. I think that's what Arthur Burns understood. And it's like, you know, if you read his memoir, he said, well, you know, I, there was too much political pressure. I just couldn't do it. And I don't think he should have. I don't think he should have sent, you know, the no problem rate to 20%. So for the 70s and much of the 80s, I star was high. Uh, and then, because mostly because of that demographic argument I was making. And then in the 90s, I star started to fall, 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 fall. Now, in some countries, it certainly surely fell below 2%. That's why in Europe and Japan, you know, everything, we, we threw the kitchen sink at it and we couldn't get it back up. I mean, in, in some way, it's kind of like my uh, my weight, if you want. Like I, I you know, I, I I know like if I if I diet, like I, I can get it under like, I'm not going to give the exact number, but there is a number under which like it doesn't fall be much beyond and, you know, kind of wants to get back back there. That's the same thing with inflation. There is this unobserved natural inflation rate that varies over decades. And I would argue that um, it has increased and it will increase in the 2020s. Uh, and, and yeah, in my, my report, I was I was quoting the, the serenity prayer, uh, the one for the AA association, you know, the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Uh, I would put the inflation rate in the things that I cannot change. And I do hope that central bankers have the wisdom to understand that. I think they do. Uh, They just can't say it publicly right now. They have to talk tough and and there's still some more tough talking. I certainly was in team higher rates. Uh, Now I'm like, I think the market is about right. Uh, but certainly the only way we can kind of accomplish the, the beautiful data version that I'm talking about is if central bankers talk like like um, like Volcker. So I think that the, the, the pattern for for uh, Powell is talk like Volcker, but act like Arthur Burns. And I think that that transition is going to probably happen sometimes next year and it will be a good thing. OK, so uh, so Jay Powell and the thinking of of hard money people for a while and uh, basically people who who defend the 2% target they say when growth is between 1 and 3% that's the real goldilocks when real growth that is inflation adjusted growth is a- at its peak uh if you have deflation that's bad everyone knows that and if you have inflation above 3% or really above 2% that is when inflation starts to eat away at growth so for example you know the past two quarters or actually the past the first and the second quarter of this year the US as many people know, uh, real GDP, quarter over quarter real GDP, inflation adjusted GDP was negative for two quarters in a row. That's why so many people say, aha, we're in a recession already. Uh, and those two quarters support the argument, aha, inflation is eating away at growth. But you are you did a more statistical, more holistic, more comprehensive study and found that actually when inflation is between 4 and 10%, Real growth is 3.8% versus when it's between when inflation is between one and three uh, percent, real growth is 3.1%. So why is it that the mainstream narrative is wrong? And then also, is there sort of a, sort of a skew of your findings where actually the Goldilocks is between one and four and a half percent? Like, at what point do you think inflation starts to become bad? Because I don't know. To right. me, you know, eight percent it's below ten percent, but eight percent is kind of bad. The point is. It's a continuum, and there is certainly no indication that there's anything specifically virtuous about two percent. I mean, if, even if you think back about, you know, the the uh, the European experience, for example, les, les trente glorieuses in France, the, the Goldilocks period between 1945 and 1975, high growth period, inflation was very high. You know, we we're coming out of the war, right? We build a country, we had to devalue the franc a bunch of time, uh, and, and in a way that. That was that was good. I mean, same with many emerging markets. Uh, many emerging markets have, a, have an inflation target of, of you know central bank emerging markets central banks have targets of three, four, five percent inflation because they understand that as economies catch up and they have young population and the prices are very low, right? In, you know, you take a cab ride in India, it's ridiculously cheap. So there is some catch up that's going to happen, and usually fast growth, quite 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 often is associated with, with rapid inflation. Now. I'm not talking in Venezuela or Argentina, right? That's, I mean, maybe the 10% cap is a little too high. I mean, if you were up to me, I'd probably target, you know, 5 6% until the end of the decade. Um, and I think an economy, as, as the other thing about inflation is that it's destructive if it just swings a lot and it's unpredictable. Uh, but, you know, why is it, you know, that... Uh, I mean, 2% means you have the value of, of your currency every uh, 35 years, right? Yeah, 
mm-hmm. 35 years, right? One percent yeah. would be 70 years. Yeah. Uh, you know, who said that? I mean, why is halving the value, the real value of the currency every 35 years a, a better choice than every 20 years? I mean, as long as it's predictable, the economy can and will adjust. Uh, the other part that, that we haven't talked into is that there are social and generational aspect consequences to the inflation target that you pick. Uh, and um, if you pick a low inflation target, if you have a period of disinflation, uh, over time, you'll increase both income inequalities, wealth inequalities, and generational inequalities. And let me explain that for a bit. I mean, the 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 inequality argument really boils down to the uh, the Piketty book, uh, Capital in the 21st Century. It's a very, very big book, um, you know, um, I mean, it's a good book, but whatever. You don't need to read the whole thing. Uh, what matters, he starts from the, the, the dividend discount model. Uh, and in the dividend discount model, we, at the denominator, we have R minus G, uh, rate of return on capital minus growth in the economy. And that number is has to be positive for assets to be valued, right? I mean, otherwise it doesn't work. Uh, and he says, well, if R is greater than G, if you make more money owning capital than the economy grows, keep in mind the economy is everybody's wages, right? So that means that, uh, capital owners make more money than workers. So over time, by definition, wealth has to concentrate in the top 1%. And that's what he shows. Uh, if R is greater than G, if we have positive real rates, which is what it means, like uh, rates in, in excess of inflation and growth, then you advantage capital at the expense of labor. Now, philosophically, you understand that you cannot do that forever because you would end up with, with an economy where the, the, you know Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos owns everything uh, and everybody else owns nothing. So at time, there needs to be periods doing with wage grow faster than the cost of capital for things to stay in balance. Mm-hmm. Now, when you have disinflation, typically you have positive real rates. So that's your R is higher than G. If you have unexpected inflation, which is what I think, certainly what we've had and what I think we should have, uh, you have, um, how do you call that? A stealth default on the rentier class. Uh, Keynes called that the euthanasia of the rentier. Um, basically, you effectively default on the people who have assets and, 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 and wages grow faster. So if we take the the age component here, the, the, which is what I love to do, the generational aspect, it's not just rich versus poor, it's also old versus young. Because when you are old, typically you're asset rich, uh, human capital poor, right? Uh, and then when you're young, your, your main resource is, is your labor and you need to convert that labor into capital. Uh, now, if you have disinflation and very low rates, as, we, as we've as we had for the past 40 years, the value of assets spikes up, right? Every financial asset is in the present value of its future cash flow brought to the present by the discount rate. The lower the discount rate, the higher the value of that asset. That works for, uh, you know, uh, uh, stocks, bonds, real estate. So after 40 years of low rates, we've seen these very, very high asset prices. Conversely, wages have not kept up with inflation almost at all. So if you divide the S&P 500 by the minimum wage, you'll see how many hours it takes to buy one share of the S&P 500. In 1982, when, when the boomers were you know making households and all that and starting to buy stocks, it took you four days at the minimum wage to buy one share in the S&P 500. Today, it takes you four months. So you have a lot work, a lot more to buy financial assets, homes, bonds, stocks, and this is why the young generation is so restless and so angry. In Europe, you know, they can't buy a house. The Italian guys stay at their mama's house until they're 45, not because it has the pasta, but because they cannot afford the flat in Milan. Uh, in the US, uh, you know, you get all these, you know, Reddit people day trading Ponzi scheme and, and meme stocks. I wish for a world where young people can buy houses start families and buy assets that would actually give them cash flow instead of hoping to find the next Ponzi scheme and be lucky. And the way to do that is by having higher wage growth. So if you think about your um, financial assets to labor ratio, the denominator is growing, wages are rising, which is what's happening right now. And then the numerator needs to shrink. And the way you shrink that is by having inflation, which over time will raise the term premium, raise long-term rates and reduce the value of financial assets. That is the process that is underway for the past year and is fundamentally a good and healthy process. It's just painful for our industry. And as a result, everybody's screaming left and right and writing open letters to Jay Powell so that it cuts rate to, pro- to save my portfolio of crappy stocks. Uh, but if he's truly concerned with you know, rebalancing the economy, 
he should see as well what's happening as 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 the natural adjustment of the economy and something to be accompanied. We don't want it to run too far. We don't want that ten percent plus inflation. But if we stay at five seven percent for a while, it's a good thing. Hey everyone, it's Jack here. Hope you're enjoying the show. Just wanted to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by Bittrex, a cryptocurrency exchange with a focus on security and dependability. Bittrex offers lightning fast trade execution on over 150 different digital assets and is protected by security practices that lead the industry. If you want to venture into crypto, I want you using Bittrex. It's an original in the space and has all the tokens that you want to trade. So click the link in the description to learn more and tell them I sent you. Now let's get back to the show. Right. So you look at a decade at the 1970s, which a lot of economists and uh, people look at as a bad decade of stagflation where inflation ate away at growth. You say, no, actually, there were some good things as well because uh, income and capital and ownership became more broad based uh, instead of the trend we've had over the past 40 years, which is you know wealth being, being concentrated in fewer and fewer hands. What Doesn't that trend, Vincent, doesn't that require not so much inflation, but uh, financial repression as in lower real rates and negative real rates. So even though the rate of inflation in the US is 8% and uh, two years ago it was, let's say, 2 or 3%, I'd actually think real rates uh, in the future, not now, but real rates now are tighter. Like the five-year real rate, the two-year real rate, I believe, is tighter now uh, than it was in 2020 because even though inflation expectations have gone up, nominal interest rates and bond yields, uh, largely driven by the Fed on the short end of the curve, have gone up even more. So someone you know who's listening to your argument saying, Vincent, like that that makes sense. And like I'll check out the book Capital. And you know, for people who don't don't want to buy the book, uh, the the author has a really good website where they, you can download all the charts and, and information. Um, that's a good f- theoretical framework for uh, a trend that takes a decade or even two decades. But Right now, you know, my income has not gone up that much over the past two years, but my costs, uh, my fixed costs such as gasoline, which I have to pay for, that's skyrocketed. Uh, and my, my debt service can cost your whole thing of, oh, yes, well, inflation will eat away my debt. It's not eating away my debt, Vincent, because interest rates have gone up more than inflation. So, so what, do you, what do you think about that? Okay, so first of all, we need to have a, a point of, of, of definition here on, on what we mean by real rates. Um, I think you... You, you you were referring to uh, break-even rates. Um, so you're referring to um, um, rates on, on short-term to me, whatever, bonds, minus implied inflation based on, on tips or inflation swaps. So you, you, you were, you, you're talking about yeah. a an implied measure, uh, which, yes, I agree right now, real rates are are very positive if you measure it like that. And by the way, that would be an argument for dovish people, right? Because you can you can say, if, if, if you keep that ambiguity of, of what real rates actually are, you can say, well, it's already there. Um, um, I am more um, basic. And I would say when I was referring to financial repression, negative real rates, I was talking about um, the Fed funds rate being below the CPI, uh, which, <laughs> In this case, it's, it's very much the case, has been the case for a long time. Uh, and and that, that is, at, at the end of the day, uh, this is, to me, the, the, the economic definition is the one that matters, not the market base, right? Because if, if you want to achieve this, this deleveraging, um, you know, your... Uh, it's it's if, if the, uh, the the rate of return on capital less than observed inflation, uh, you are effectively uh, defaulting on on the boomers, which is which is my obsession. Uh, I want to default on the boomers, <laughs> uh, uh, or, or or the rich. A soft default of inflation, where boomers own a lot of government bonds and that capital is just worth less because they're going to be paid back in five years, and in five years, a thousand dollars is going to be worth six hundred dollars. Correct. Today. Yeah, correct, yeah. Correct, correct. So that, that, that's what I was referring to. Uh, inflation expectations can do whatever they want. I mean, it's, it's a market base, you know, like depends on the swap market. And you could also argue that there is some intervention from the Fed. The Fed own, owns a bunch of tips. So yes. they control both the target and the tool, which is probably not a good way to say policy, but. Yes, I, I take the criticism. Uh, and so so uh, tips yields are a combination of nominal yields and inflation break-evens, which are market projections or, or market pricing in what inflation will be. 
but that it's not, you can't really trust it. I mean, break evens a year ago were way, they were not 8% and inflation has been 8%. So it's possible that break evens now are way too low. Uh, that being said, there is a little bit of that's my view. There is a little bit of a duration mismatch when you know CPI over the measures the change to the consumer price index over the past year, whereas the Fed funds now is an overnight rate. So it, there there is a little bit of duration. But um, uh, okay, all right. M- moving on, uh, Vincent, to the asset markets, you have a portfolio called the Holy Trinity portfolio, and I want to ask you about that. But but first, I actually want to ask you about your outlook on broad asset markets. You know, you're not one to make big macro uh, calls about, oh, the S&P 500, it's going to go up 20%, it's going to go down 30%. But this time you actually are, you wrote an article um, for, for Stonex, a piece called uh, Sizing This Big Bear, how your target for the S&P 500 is 2950, which would mark a decline uh, of what, 20, 20 to 30% from, from current levels. So uh, why are you so bearish on the S&P 500? And it is scoring 3,000 for, uh, you know, uh, argument's sake. In general, it's, it's the same, the, uh, the, the same view that, uh, I think, uh, long rates need to move higher because inflation is, is secular in the system. And, you know, if you, because stocks are such a long duration asset, um, if you increase the discount rate, um, necessarily, and I'm, I'm Somewhat bullish on growth, but even so, I, I think the, uh, the the overall effect is is going to be uh, lower equity multiples. Uh, and you know, I, I I made a little mathematical derivation, which you know, I mean, dividend ca- anyone who's done discounted cash flow models knows that you just tilt your assumption by one one bit one there, and you can get to pretty much any number you want. Um, I, th- I don't think any of my assumptions were that crazy. I mean, the, the biggest adjustment I made was to earnings. Uh, I, you know, I think right now, I don't think stocks have gotten significantly cheaper in the past year. I mean, they're down about 20%, right? Um, but you know, we're pricing 10% earnings growth next year. Uh, and I really don't see that happen. Uh, 10% EPS growth next year. I mean, we, we are, you know, negative, a little negative this quarter, most likely. How would it accelerate? I mean, just walk me through how that works. I mean, everybody is, is bearish on the top line and, and you know, the economy is going to slow, yada, yada. So what, what analysts are really telling us that margins are going to expand this year. How can margins expand? You have to pay more for commodities. You have to pay more for labor and you have to pay 10 times as much on your interest expense. I mean, every single element of your income statement and red <laughs> minus sign is growing uh, and your top line is slowing. I mean, margins are going to go down. So I have a very basic model. I'm, I'm not like a bottoms up analyst. I don't, I don't track thousands of companies and whatever. I just look at the big stuff. Uh, and I was looking at, um, and I have a basic model just looks at the 12 month change in, in the prime rate. So cost of borrowing for companies, 12 month change in junk spread, uh, risk, risk appetite, 12 month spread is a change in, in, in um, the uh, commodity prices and 12 month change in the dollar index, which matters a lot, for, especially for S&P 500 earnings where you earn so much of your profits to receive. Now that model does a fairly good job at, at seeing the big turns when it comes to EPS. Uh, and my model is predicting decline of 7% next year, which I don't think is all that bad, actually. I mean, most recessions, you, you see double-digit decline in EPS. So it's kind of consistent with my view that this is going to still be a mild recession. Uh, you have to go from plus 10 to minus 7. So that's about a 20% compression. So sure, your, your PS dropped by 20. But in my view, the E, the forward E, dropped by 20 as well. So equities are not cheaper today than they were last year. Uh, so we still need uh, valuations to come down significantly. Uh, maybe another 15, 20% that would get us to that 3000 target. I think top to bottom, that would be about a 40% bear market, which is big, but, but not crazy. It's only seen worse. Uh, and, and it will also get us, I mean, if I just look at it on a technical basis, like 3000, it's kind of that this good, good support, uh, well, resistance now it used to be the support pre 2018. Took us a while, so I think that's a, that's a good, nice round number. Uh, and then, if you take a very long term chart, it would be kind of reverting to the the post 1995 long term rate of return of stocks. I I kind of view the world since 1995 as just a succession of bubbles. Uh, you know, this is when we started having the Fed put right after LTCM in 1998. We had the internet bubble, the housing bubble, uh, the biotech bubble, the crypto bubble, the uh, the second tech bubble. I mean, just there was bubble on top of bubbles uh, with insane multiple expansion. I think this is 
this age kind of needs to revert and we need to revert to kind of a more normal environment like we were in the mid 90s when you had by the way four or five percent inflation and, and very good growth and also lower equity multiples and that three thousand target achieves that if in a year the s p 500 is not at three thousand but at four thousand or maybe even five thousand what are the reasons do you think you you will have been wrong sort of what what are you assuming that will will not be true that will, will prove your your prediction to be inaccurate. And by the way, Vincent, over the past, you know, more than a year, you, you've been so right that you can afford to have a few calls that are, are wrong because, you know, you, you're, you're, you're batting uh, oh. above, above the average, I'd say. Oh, trust me. I, I will. I, I'll show, we all revert to the mean. I mean <laughs> the world is nothing but, but mean reversion. Uh, but, but thank you for, for that. Um, I think maybe I, if I'm wrong about inflation, you know, if, if inflation does slow and, and goes to 2% and, and, and the Fed can, can pivot much more than I expect and can, you know, and, and do QE and, 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 and then if we go, yeah, if we go down to very low interest rates, the multiple rises up a lot. Uh, you, you can go back to paying 40 times for Microsoft earnings uh, because, well, if, you know, if I, if I only get 2% on a 10-year bond, I'd, I'd much rather get a, you know, Two percent uh, um, earnings yield on Microsoft because these earnings are growing, and I'm getting a dividend with it. Uh, so yeah, if inflation falls faster than that, that, like if if a lot of the, um, in a weird way, I, I mean, there's this 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 um, paradox is that the more bullish you are on the economy, the more bearish you are on stocks. So if if the Uber bears, like the guys who are like screaming out of their lungs, like the Fed is going to tighten into a recession, it's the biggest policy mistake in a generation, that, that you know, they're the driving, looking at the rear view mirror and all that. Well, if that happens, uh, then we'll see at some point rates go back to zero or even below. Negative rates, why not? You know, QE, whatever. And at this point, you just want to buy any financial asset. Now, I would argue that is a horrible outcome. I mean, it's basically the the, the European outcome, you know, where, where your economy can never grow, your rates always stay negative. Uh, and, and and then, you know, everybody buys apartments in Geneva. And, you know, the old people are are, are very, very rich. And the young people are are, are struggling, don't make kids. Uh, and uh, and it's the, uh, the snake that it's its own tail. But I think that's, that is the bullish case for stocks. And then personally, that's, that's not a world that I like. Okay. So you're saying the deep recession scenario where earnings fall sharply, something akin to 2008, maybe not as bad, like not as bad as 1931, 32, but you know, bad. That scenario is actually bullish for stocks because financial conditions will ease. Uh, well, a few things. One, if you're right that a recession will not cause inflation to moderate, it's possible the Fed won't won't ease, but but setting that aside, Vincent, uh, aren't there e- examples of in you know, two thousand one, two thousand two, two thousand three, uh, and two thousand seven, two thousand eight, two thousand nine, where the Federal Reserve tightens, uh, excuse me, eases monetary policy uh, by cutting rates to very low levels, but that does not cause the stock market to rebound. You know, looking back at March of twenty twenty, that was a case where boom, the Fed cuts rates to zero. And starts buying, you know, a, a trillion dollars of assets a- every month. That was very bullish, and you know, the, the incredibly sh- fall in asset prices was very sharp. But it lasted for a very short, long period of time. And I believe it was March twenty third that marks the the bottom in asset prices. And it was pretty much a, a party after that if you owned any risk assets. But historically, when the Fed eases, that is not a signal to buy, right? I, I mean, it wasn't. In, 2007, the, the, I think the Fed cut rates in 2007, or, right, or maybe, right, or, right, right. yeah, or, and and then in 2001, you know, the bear market stocks lasted from three years until 2003. So, so why are you convinced <laughs> that this uh, a Fed pivot would be so bullish for stocks on such a short time horizon, like it was in 2020? Right. Well, first of all, I mean, I would say like in, in the other two cases you mentioned, like, oh, wait, in, in 2001, 2002, I mean, eventually it worked, right? When they got to zero, um, <laughs> You know, eventually things rallied, uh, and, and they rallied big. And after wait, it, it, it was a fifteen years of, of going straight up. True. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, typically you don't want to buy the first cut, right? You want to you want to buy the last cut, or you, know, or you want to buy as you get to zero, or um, you know, again, I think we, we're doing hypothetical in which I don't believe in right now. Uh, but you know, if, if we want to play that game, uh, I, I would think that the, the market would react even faster. 
to rate cuts because we've seen the movie so many times before, right? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I know what's next. Okay, what's next? Then you're going to announce QE and then you're going to buy every junk bond on the planet. Uh, and then if that's not enough, you're just going to buy equity straight up. So I'm going to go in front of that and I'm just going to buy. And then I think that's why the, the response time, you know, we, we understand the Fed put now. We, we had 20 years to practice. Uh, so I, I, people learn. Uh, but again, this is not my base case. Uh, what I what I think happens next year is that inflation slows, maybe just enough to go below the Fed funds rate, but not much beyond that. And the Fed funds uh, rate will be five percent. That's what the terminal rate is priced in now. So yeah, like, yeah. yeah, yeah. If I mean, I have a model where I look. There's a possibility that the two lines cross briefly between April and, and May, where you'll have a, what I call positive real rates, meaning the Fed funds rate above the CPI, uh, which would be the, the justification for stopping the rate hikes. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure that they're going to cut. I think they're just going to stay there. And what then what happens is as inflation fails to slow, then slowly the long end of the curve starts to increase. Uh, and we're looking at um, perhaps a flat yield curve. Uh, where where everything is at five percent first, and then maybe it can rise to six, seven percent in the ten years, and that to me is what is going to cause the multiple compression that I'm talking about. TLT. If you hold guys, if people people listening to this interview are own the, the ETF TLT, you got to hold your ears because this is uh, <laughs> blasphemy. The the, seven, the ten year. No, it's, it's okay. If you own TLT, you've already proven a tolerance for pain this year that is extremely high. So. <laughs> you know, there's some masochism aspect to, to that ETF at this point. Yes, yes. So, Vincent, earlier I asked you the question, what's your confidence that if we have a deep recession, inflation won't moderate? And you gave some very uh, compelling answers to that. Now my question is, why do you think the recession won't be deep? Because as, let's say, Kathy Wood pointed out in her open letter to the Fed, which I believe you, you referenced earlier, uh, interest rates have gone from 25 basis points to Three, uh, three, uh, um, three percent, and that is a twelve times higher uh, uh, rate of, of increase. Uh, you know, some some mild uh, statistics that I don't know. You know, uh, if you took a financial statistics class, I don't know if they they would characterize in that way. Like, oh, Volcker only did twice. He he only doubled rates from eight to sixteen percent, and uh, Powell has. 12x. No, from, wait, and Lagarde, Lagarde, she went from, from negative to positive. I mean, this is more than infinity here in, in terms of percentage change. She's an infinite I mean, hiker. Yeah. If you go from negative one basis point to one positive one basis point, you're an infinite hiker. It is true, Kathy Wood's point, that the rise in interest rates, it is true that that is very high. And we've gone so quickly from zero that you look at you, uh, interest rate sensitive sectors of the economy, like automobile lending. Uh, mortgage lending are absolutely frozen. Where you know refinanced activity is down sixty or seventy percent. Uh, you know housing indices are dropping from fifty to ten month over month, yeah. and that's that's it's it's crazy. I mean, you are seeing some pretty carnage, not necessarily in the prices so far; they're declining, but not carnage. But you're seeing absolute carnage in the financing of the of cars and housing. So uh, why couldn't something? Uh, why couldn't a, a deep recession happen? Well, first I'm going to start with. Uh, I don't, know, I don't know if it's a joke, but it's the line that uh, I was in a road trip in Brazil last week and a, a client gave it to me. So I, I thought it was funny referring to monetary policy. So Jay Powell is like someone who wants a baby next month and, and, and he forgot to start nine months ago. So he decided to impregnate nine women right now. Um, <laughs> you know, kind of the same thing. So now, now we're putting hikes on top of each other to make up for the fact that we didn't do hikes when we should have, which is last summer. Uh, but, you know, in the analogy, yeah, it still takes nine months to make a baby, even if you impregnate nine women. Um, so there is an element of that to monetary policy, almost like a panic hiking. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's it, I kind of agree with many of the things you mentioned and, you know, you know, very, you know, people I like and respect, uh, you know, like Daniel Donati, Martino Booth, Alex Gurevich, uh, Mike Green. Uh, they, they all pointed to the, the damage that this very fast-paced cycle could do on, on several markets and you certainly start to see that in the data. Um, so, yeah, my, my view would be maybe a distinction between um, the financial economy and the real economy where, um, yeah, it's, you know, for, for most of the past 10, 15 years, you know, it was a party on Wall Street and it was uh, uh, hard times on, on Main Street. Um, and, and I think this, this is going to play out the other way around, uh, where maybe, uh, we do see a lot of damage, whether, you know, you look at the 
commercial real estate. That's that's terrible. I mean, a lot of real estate. I mean, cap rates with seven percent. You know, they were not priced anywhere. Not no one was pricing seven percent in, in their cap rate tables. Uh, securitized markets could break. Many things could break. Uh, probably some of them are breaking already. Uh, but then when it comes to like Main Street, I I'm, I'm not so sure. I mean, we still have a a lot of fiscal stimulus. Uh, you know, we, we trillion dollar deficits, massive stimulus coming out of Europe, and basically it's like, oh, we're gonna we're gonna you know put that in the deficit. The whole energy crisis. Um, we had the uh, the student loan cancellation, so a whole generation which was shackled by the weight of student loan debt is is now free to consume. Uh, we have a consumer that is relatively has very le- little leverage. Uh, credit card balances are very low. Delinquencies are very low. Uh, I don't rising. think we're going to- low but rising. Yeah, yeah again, it's just, uh, I keep getting these uh, flow versus stock arguments, and and yes, the bearish guys look at the flow. Look at look at look at the quarterly change in that. You know, look at the, look at the three month quarterly change in that, and then analyze it, and then they take these three things off, and and you get why I want. Okay, I. I'm just going to be dumb, okay? I just look at how big the pile of savings is. You look at cash deposits and bank yeah. accounts, huge. You look at household net worth, um, you know, it increased by 40 trillion, trillion with a T between Q2, uh, Q1 two, Q of 2020 to Q2, 40 trillion. That's how much wealthier we are. So yeah, maybe we lose another 10, 20, 30 trillion. I don't know. But 40, it's so huge. I mean, during the Great Depression, the Great Recession, household net worth dropped by only 8 trillion. This everything rally that we had in the past two years is like five great recessions on top of each other in the other direction. Uh, So I think we're still processing through that historical stimulus. Uh, And I also think, again, your labor market is going to stay tight for the demographic reasons that I I highlighted. Uh, Also, maybe companies are gonna start hoarding labor workers because it's so hard to find them in the first place. So the unemployment rate doesn't go up. And and I think if you don't lose your job, you're, you're fine. You know, like you don't use job, you still go out, you still eat, you certainly don't walk out of your home the way we didn't wait, especially since house prices have appreciated so much. I mean, you know, Miami is probably up 100% in the past two years. So yeah, even if prices of condos in Miami fall by, by 50%, people still have positive equity in the house, so they're not going to walk out. Uh, so I think Main Street is okay. Uh, also keep in mind that, you know, most people don't own stocks or own financial assets. I mean, most people have less than 400 bucks in the bank. So, you know, trying to club them with a wealth effect, which seems to be the, the policy of Powell, uh, it's not a very efficient way. You know, like um, Zuckerberg's fortune has probably dropped by 65% since the start of the year. I mean, his consumption has not dropped by 65%. I mean, it no. just cannot. It's, yeah. So so we're kind of targeting the wrong group here. We, we are, you know, uh, trying to make the, the wealthy a little less wealthy. Uh, but really, the, the the stress in the system, the, the bottleneck, uh, is at the bottom. Uh, is kind of you know hourly workers that are willing to bust table for 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 ten bucks an hour. This is what we cannot find of construction workers. Well, I could bring up counter arguments of you know housing is a huge percentage of GDP and yes. stuff like that. But but let's yes. move move on, Vincent. You are focusing on something you call the Holy Trinity. So what are the components of the Holy Trinity? And why do you think that these sorts of assets, these sectors, investments in, in the stocks and these particular sectors uh, is, is is prudent at this time? So yeah, Holy Trinity is three economic sectors, energy, healthcare, financial, 100% equity portfolio. It's up 6% for the year. In a year when the stock market is down 20. Now, why is it up? Well, because it hedges against the three main risks that we've had. And every correction this year, every day the market was down, it was about either of these three things. Inflation is too hot. Your energy is the best performing sector. Oh no, there's going to be a recession. Healthcare is the best performing sector. Oh no, the Fed is going to hike to 7%. Financial is the best performing sector. So whatever bad thing happens, you always have a third of your portfolio in the best performing sector. And um, it is a beautiful portfolio. It is naturally balanced. It's naturally diversified. And you get it for dirt cheap. You're paying six six times earning for, on your energy top. On your banks, you're paying like nine times, 10 times if you're good, if you want to buy uh, you know the quality banks. Uh, on healthcare, you're paying 15, which is a bit more, but a whole lot better than paying 30 times times 
30 times earnings of tech. So you get a very high dividend yield because of your energy, very high buyback yield because you get the banks who are doing a lot of buybacks. Uh, and also I would argue very good secular growth because I think healthcare is a sector of the highest secular growth in the US. Uh, and it hedges you against the three main risks. Uh, so you have, if you plot it versus 60, 40, you have a lot less volatility, still high expected return because of all valuation. And again, what to me is the most important thing protection against the three major macro risks of 2023. Hmm. And tell me about uh, the correlations between the, these uh, uh, sectors and the S&P in general. So uh, as you mentioned, the 60-40 the portfolio, portfolio consisting of 60% stocks and 40% bonds, has had the worst year on decade. I, I believe you write that it's close to already being worse than 2008. And you know, we've still got two more months left. Uh, during the times when the 60-40 portfolio is failing, you note that commodities tend to do well. And that's, you, you make some other points on correlation. To tell me about this. And then can you, can you just relate it to the fundamental correlation you just talked about where on days when inflation is the fear, energy as well, uh, and yields go up and then financials right. do well, stuff like that. Yeah. So on the correlation, um, it basically... Big picture, when you have deflation or disinflation, you have a very, your risk of asset is long-term treasuries because your worry is, is growth. So when stocks go down, it's because you think growth is going to slow. When growth is going to slow, you want to buy treasuries. This is the risk on risk off environment we've been for, for the past 15 years. Conversely, when you have a high inflation environment like we had in the 70s and the 80s, um, treasuries and stocks sell off at the same time, clearly something that we saw so far this year. Uh, because your big, your big worry is, oh, inflation is too high, rates are going to go up, and then you discount rate increase in both cases, which is the present value of all financial assets. Uh, what you hedge it with, however, is commodities, right? Because commodities but naturally benefit from, from inflation. So, um, and, and that's a, almost a portfolio construction argument for energy. My, my friend Warren Price has been writing a lot about this. He's like, you don't need to be a secular bull. I mean, I, I cannot happen to be a commodities bull, but you don't need that. You just need to look at correlations. What is a diversifying asset? And right now, it's more diversifying to own commodities that is own treasuries if you look at the trading one-year correlation of the 60-40 portfolio. So every asset allocator is going to see that, and every asset allocator is going to have the same pitch from the consultants. It's going to tell them, oh, you need to invest in commodities as an asset class. And the last time I heard that was 2004. And then what ensued was an eight-year bull market for commodities because every pension fund insurance was told to own commodities, to diversify the portfolio, reduce the variance, increase the sharp, Markowitz, and all that good stuff. Uh, so there is an investment case for commodity. And I think it, it's possible that as the global economy slows, and I'm not denying many of the things you pointed out in the US, even for the US, uh, physical demand is going to slow, but it could be replaced by investment demand for commodities as a hedge against inflation. You also have a, a, a sector scorecard as of October 3rd, 2022, and you, you rank sectors uh, uh, based on growth and quality and valuation. And, and basically, uh, energy is number one, consumer discretionary is number 11 out of, out of the 11 sectors. Uh, why did you, what, what led you to, to do this, uh, have the numbers come out, come out there? And yeah, can, can you tell us why sort of you're, you're so bearish or on a relative basis of consumer discretionary and utilities and real estate right. and things like that? Right, right. So, so this is a model that we built for, for one of our large, uh, institutional clients. They were just looking for a sector rotation model and an easy way to kind of combine information on fundamentals, growth, uh, balance sheet quality valuations and, and technicals and, and risk management. So I, I, you know, it's one of these big quant models, got about a hundred different indicators, poured them into, got a nice little color coded. And the models work really good since we launched in real time. Like, you know, most models work great, you know, in, in, in the past. Uh, this one worked well, it worked in the real world. And, you know, it did that mostly by going into energy uh, for, for the past two years, like steady energy materials. Uh, and, and then the, the interesting thing was number three, because energy materials really should be combined. It's just one sector, same trade. Uh, so the next best was always healthcare. Uh, and healthcare, I think healthcare works because it's one of these GARP sectors, like growth at a reasonable price. Uh, so you have, you know, quality balance sheets, right? Good, you know, um, low debt, uh, uh, resilient margins, of course, because they get to set the price for what they sell. They're not impacted by, by inflation, right? Because the cost, what's the cost for healthcare, right? It's, a, it's lobbying basically. And, you know, I mean, having patents, you know, you, you have the patent for Lipitor, I mean, you know. 
I mean, the, the marginal cost of the pill is zero, right? So it doesn't really matter. The commodity prices explode. Um, and um, so, yeah, the, the balance sheet is solid. The valuation, if you adjust it over time, is actually one sort of deviation below the norm. Uh, compared to tech that is still once on deviation above. So the way I think of healthcare is you, you, you're getting tech-like growth for half the value. Uh, and when I say tech-like growth, I mean that. Uh, over the past four years, EPS growth in the healthcare sector has outpaced growth in tech. And I think this is kind of one of the secular inflection points. Um, I think every 10 years, you have a, a big story that, that we all fall in love with. You know, in the 90s, it was the internet. In the 2000s, it was China, commodities, the BRICS, yada, yada. 2010, it was big tech. I really think that 2020 is all going to be about healthcare. And it's going to be because the boomers are aging and dying. So they're going to spend a lot more money on healthcare. It's going to be because our generation is obsessed with health. I mean, I sometimes give a speech in San Francisco at the kind of local, um, you know, um, VC and tech event. And I mean, people don't talk about tech. I mean, tech is so boring. Like, tech tech is like Mark Zuckerberg taking a picture of himself in, 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 the, in, in the metaverse. Like, oh, look, I have legs. Like, this, this, this to me is a quintessential symbol of the decline of, of tech innovation. And we, 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 we're over this stuff. They want to talk about, you know, the diet, the dopamine hacks, the biohacks. I mean, even the innovation, like the exciting stuff is, is, is in the body. You know, it's, it's, it's about, you know, combining technology and the body to, to prevent disease or to cure them or to reverse aging. So you have this whole narrative about, you know, transforming the body uh, that, that gives you that kind of long-term growth narratives that equity investors like. Uh, and like I said, you're getting at a very cheap valuation. A uh, relatively cheap valuation compared compared to other growth sectors. So that's my call for healthcare. And on top of that, historically, it's been the best performing sector during recession. I think people make that mistake to think the most defensive is utilities, and I think that is especially stupid right now because you know what? Why would you get you know? Every, we've seen the flows into utilities. That's almost reflexive for all recession by utilities. But what is the trigger for this recession? Higher rates. Now, why would you buy something with an eight to ten year duration? a lot of operational risk and a 4% dividend yield when you can get that rolling T-bills. Uh, whose, biggest, whose biggest input cost is, is commodities and energy prices. Correct, correct. So every usually on average, healthcare is the best performing sector of recession, but I think especially now because this recession is about high rates and high inflation, things to which healthcare is not that much exposed while utilities are very much exposed. And I'm not even talking about real estate, of course. Tell me about energy. Uh, you said that it trades on a six to six uh, earnings, a uh, price to earnings ratio. Is that, is, is a forward ratio? And also should we say, you know, that, that six price to earnings ratio is with oil at 80 or 90 bucks and it will get even cheaper if oil goes to $120, let alone $150. But if oil goes back to $40, you know, this, the sector could, could lose money, right? Sure. Or it could go negative and, you know, and then they'll, they'll have to, uh, I mean, uh, by the way, that, that six in the U S and you look at Europe, we are talking like three, four times earnings. Uh, basically the energy sector is, is, is working off the assumption that, you know, We'll, we'll achieve the, the race to zero in three years and, and nothing on the balance sheet past three years is worth anything. We won't need oil anymore. You know, just, okay, you need your cash flow in three years and then done, close the shop, no more ExxonMobil and BP and Shell and all that stuff. Uh, okay, you know, why not? Uh, but um, another reason for the, 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 the bullishness on, on the energy sector is, as you know, we have a, a backward lead. We've been a, a I had a backward lead oil curve for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, which, by the way, is indication that the, the economy is actually strong because you have demand for physical product. And that's, that's the reason to be bullish, in my opinion, that we had a bear market with a backward lead curve. But past that, analysts, when they do the discounted cash flow model, they, they, they derive their, their, you know, they plug in the future production and then look at the forward curve and then and they multiply by the implied price. So when you have a backward lead curve, you're pricing, you know, that oil is going to be like 75 next year. Uh, so that that makes your forward earnings look, look smaller. Now, historically, the, the forward curve tells you nothing about the spot, right? I mean, we have efficient markets and, you know, all of that. So energy earnings are underestimated. I mean, if anything, I, I view the, the bigger risk to the upside. I think we have a, 
We have a, an OPEC put or Biden put, or SPR put now. I mean, basically, if, if oil prices fall below 80, you know that OPEC is going to come out and cut production and you know that that Biden is going to try to refill the SPR. So, no, I do not feel oil price. I do not think oil price falls to 40%, $40 a barrel. I think the biggest risk is that we see oil price increase this winter because of maybe new sanctions on Russia, because of a big pipeline blowing up somewhere, uh, because of maybe a colder winter. And, and then that would really throw a wrench into this whole like uh, disinflation Fed people story. That that to me is the biggest short-term risk for markets. You, you and you want to hedge that by owning energy stocks. You have been bullish on energy for a while, and that is the only sector in the S&P 500 that's been up this year. You've been definitely right about that. Vincent, at this juncture, are you worried that about the glut of natural gas that's in European storage tanks, where this whole year the, the, the narrative is there's not enough natural gas, there's not enough natural gas. And I definitely was played a part in, in spreading that narrative. But there's so much excess storage in European uh, um, facilities that I believe yesterday, actually, uh, oil, excuse me, natural gas traded negative for the, for the next right, oil. And right, I don't know right. a lot of that has to do with the weather and stuff. Right. But I mean, yeah, do, do you think that the uh, Europe, Europe's ability to secure supplies for the winter uh, has has proved so far successful or what do you, what do you think? Well, for first off, I want to do a um, hats off to uh, Andrea Steno, uh, mm -hmm. your, your colleague here. I mean, he, he's been writing about, a lot about that and um, it's really nailed that. And, and at a time when it was definitely not the popular opinion, I mean, you had a lot of uh, kind of doomsday energy, you know, Europe's going to freeze type of stuff and, you know, prices will rise to infinity. So, I, I don't follow this as closely as he does. It seems to me that the problem, the reason why prices are negative now is is, is, is that we cannot move the stuff. You know, it's it's kind of hard to, uh, it's not, you know, uh, oil is a global market, not gas is a regional market. Um, so I don't really see have, you know, spillover effect. It doesn't really matter what, what oil prices are in, in, in Rotterdam for, uh, you know, the profits of, of ExxonMobil or, or not that much. Uh, so, you know, we have negative price because the net gas cannot move. Uh, so that also means that I think eventually the storage will, will kind of normalize. I mean, the, you, you will get cold in Europe. Um, so I, yeah, I don't think it's, it's I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting market development, but it's, it's mostly a regional issue. Mm. Got it. Um, Vincent, my final question for you is what have you made in the absolute chaos in the long-term government bond market, the, the huge bear market in duration? We referenced it earlier talking about TLT, but you know the, the UK gilt sold off so much the Bank of England had to intervene. Last week, we're recording this on Tuesday, October 25th, last week, the weakness in the US long-term market 20 years, 30 years was quite noticeable. Uh, do you think that uh, th this is uh, significant? And you know, do you think the sell-off will continue given that you're a secular inflationist? Yeah, I think there's more where that came from. Um, and obviously, I mean, yeah, the, maybe this is the thing that's breaking. It's, it's a long-term treasury market. Certainly, uh, I know another, another person who's been really, really right and very nice about it too is, is Joseph Wang. Um, I think, you know, any any... Kind of treasury market or Fed policy interview, you you, you really want to listen to what he has to say, and you know he was insanely bearish on, on long duration assets earlier this year, and you know even I was thinking really that yeah, high, and I agree with him, I agree with him, yeah. <laughs> but like I was like, whoa, this is a bold call, <laughs> and I mean nailed it. Uh, so yeah, no, I, th I think there is more where it comes from, uh, you know, and in 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 Europe in general, especially in France, we you know. We love to like, you know, <laughs> look at the British, look at them. <laughs> they don't know, you know, they don't know what they're doing. You know, the prime minister do not last longer than a, than a lettuce. <laughs> uh, but um, more often than not, what happens in the UK eventually spreads to the rest of the world, whether it's, you know, the Magna Carta, the Glorious Revolution, uh, the Beatles, uh, Margaret Thatcher, uh, Brexit, 
uh, the UK gets it first. And then I don't think the UK is the only country with a deeply underfunded pension sector that has absolutely no clue on how to work and may have done some very stupid things and buy expensive products that did not factor in, you know, the kind of yield shock that we're seeing right now. Uh, I think we just saw it first in the UK, but we'll, we'll see that spread. Uh, maybe the next to drop is the European bond market. I mean, certainly liquidity is going to be a huge issue there. Uh, right now, it's an artificial support, right? That the ECB is, you know, thinking of raising rates by 100 basis points, but they spend the balance sheet at the same time. It's like, guys, like, I mean, <laughs> pick one, you know? It's like, yeah, you're like looking at a boat. One guy's rowing one direction. The other guy's rowing the other one. And then the guy's like, why is my boat not moving? Um, so at some point, you know, you, you probably see some of that happen. Uh, treasury market liquidity is very poor. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can have these kind of asymmetric moves uh, where, you know, prices deviate from fundamentals. Like, I, I don't think, you know, yield should go like, you know, 7%, at least not in the short term, but it's possible that that we see more of that. Um, so um, I've I've seen duration as, as, as the biggest risk to your portfolio for two years now. I still think it is. Uh, and you want a shorter new duration, which is another argument for my Trinity portfolio. It's a very short duration asset, right? Your energy has a three-year duration and your banks have a very little duration. I haven't talked about the banks yet, but, you know, you have a very big buyback. You have a high dividend yield. Uh, you have, uh, you know, a very fat net interest margin. And if I'm right, uh, you also have very low foreclosures, very low default. Uh, so that that is also a reason for my Holy Trinity portfolio. I should also note, I believe you're you're bullish on gold and Brazilian equities as well, right? Yeah, I mean, can, can someone say he's bullish on gold in you know October 2022? Uh, I mean, let, let's just say I you know I um, I I'm so disheartened that uh, you know just like at this point why sell? And, I mean, <laughs> no jokes aside. If my case is right that eventually we kind of get this this uh, Damascus conversion. To, to the fact that inflation is not that bad, that we do not need, need to wreck the ball, uh, destroy the world with a dollar wrecking ball. Um, I think my case, is, I think in, in somewhere in 2023, gold will, gold will lose its shine when we realize that financial repression is a solution that will need negative interest rate for a long time, then this will be the time to own gold. And then Brazil, I, I, I'm I just back from there and I, you know, I made the joke, I, I think Brazil is gonna be a meme stock next year. Um, you know, it's got a, it's got a great story to tell. Um, you know, people are a bit worried about the election. I'm not. Um, uh, anyway, that's going to be passed. And then, you know, you get the commodities, you get, you get the middle class thing going on. Still, we can always tell that. Uh, and then you get the cuts, rate cuts. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, the central bank, yeah. the Brazilian central banks, you know, hiked the city up to north of 13%. And now inflation is falling. Now you have about like real, real, real rates, meaning, yeah. Uh, policy rate minus inflation of 5% in Brazil and inflation is falling. So the next thing you see is going to be cuts, cuts, cuts while the rest of the world is hiking. So you'll see bear market everywhere and come to bonds and then Brazil will be kind of the, the exception and they'll have a great story to tell about commodities, about especially the ag stuff, about you know the, the deals to sell more so being to China and also this kind of Brazil. The nice thing is such, such a large economy that you know, you have this kind of domestic engine that, you know, doesn't really, you know, that can propel the economy regardless of, of what the rest of the world does. Vincent, it's been so great having you on. Uh, people can follow you on Twitter at Vincent Deloard. I really enjoy reading your reports that you, you write for uh, Stonex. You, you really are not only a great thinker, as people can, can see in the interviews, but you are, you're a great writer as well. Two final questions. Where can people find your work at Stonex? And then also, what are some of your favorite finance books? <laughs> Um, so, um, my work, uh, you go to my, my Twitter, uh, profile. So, uh, it's my handles at Vincent that you are the I N C N T D L U A R D. And then my pin twin, my pinned tweet has a link where you can subscribe to a free trial. Uh, so it's institutional only. Uh, so we'll ask you for your name, but you know, everybody gets a free trial as long as they're institutional and, and you can get there. You can also j j just, just. You know, Twitter is fantastic. I mean, you know, I, I was fortunate to, to meet some very, very smart people there when I when I was like really just starting here and, and people took the time to answer my questions. So I, I try to do the same. Uh, so just, just DM me. Uh, I, I love this conversation. I, I think it's, you know, fantastic what happened with, with podcasts and, and, and shows such as yours where we get this kind of community of, of people who, who think. And as long as it's done in a respectful manner, I, I love to disagree with people as well. 
so yeah. Uh, and then the second part of you your question, favorite book. books. Uh, so I'll go with two. Uh, one is The Prize, uh, which is a Daniel Jurgen history of the oil market. Uh, since, you know, it was first discovered to, I mean, really, if you want, if you love history, economic history, which I do, if you love geopolitics, which I do, and if you want to understand anything about the 20th century, it is the century of oil. And whoever controls oil eventually says to rule, and I actually believe it's still true today. Um, it's beautifully written by someone who knows the oil market better than, than anyone I can think of. And yeah, it's about a thousand pages, but it's a page turner. And then the second one, I'm going to be a little more out of consensus here, uh, but I'm going to go with Depth by David Graeber. Uh, ah. who is, yes, yes, he's yeah. a somewhat of a Marxist or Marxian economist in the UK. And he has, it's also a thousand page, uh, but it's, yeah, it's basically a history of debt. And, and if you think about it, a history of debt is really a history of humanity. It's a history of currency. And, and it really helped me, um, kind of lose some of my, um, um, kind of libertarian gold bugs, in, which I think is quite common in our industry, right? I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're 17 and you're in Ayn Rand and you want to work at a hedge fund. And, and then, and then hopefully at some point there comes a, a time of maturation in your life and you start to think about how the world actually works as opposed to how you would want it to work. And you realize that other models of human behavior, especially MMT, modern monetary theory, uh, are much better at explaining what actually happens in the world. And that, that, to me, that was the introduction to, to kind of MMT and thinking of currency in different manner. And a lot of the conversation that I was having about, about generations, uh, uh, debt, interest rate, and the role of inflation as, as, as a tool to redistribute income in groups came from that book. The fantastic recommendations, Vincent. Uh, I full, full, uh, heartedly endorse both of those. Both of those are on my bookshelf. <laughs> I've read uh, Debt, a fantastic book. I, I have the prize, and I've read like the first uh, 150 pages. Uh, I, I need to go back and I revisit because it, because it, it is a wonderful work as well. Um, Vincent, uh, thank you so much and uh, talk soon. Jack, a pleasure. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. A few housekeeping items before I let you go. Subscribe to the BlockWorks Macro YouTube channel so you don't miss another episode of Forward Guidance. Uh, you can find Forward Guidance, the podcast you just listened to, on your favorite podcast app. That's Apple Podcast, Spotify, Overcast, Podbean. Uh, it's Podbean as in on this pod, I've been saying that the Fed pivot is still far away. In addition, please check out today's sponsor. It really helps the show. Link is in the description. Finally, BlockWorks is looking for a video editor. Go to blockworks.co careers to learn more. Thanks for watching.